Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy Shalal, to everyone here at Busboys and Poets. I know that I share with many people this feeling that when you come to Busboys and Poets, you know that you're going to be around some like-minded people. And uh, the idea that like-minded people, particularly with some of the ideas that we're talking about here tonight, could actually turn that like-mindedness into political force at a time such as this could not be a more critical topic. It's not enough that many of the ideas, particularly progressive issues and values that so many of us feel strongly about, are shared uh, by the majority of Americans. I mean, you could look at poll after poll. The majority of Americans want universal health care. The majority of Americans want free college. The majority of Americans want uh, a, a lower military budget. The majority of Americans want greater action on climate change. The problem is not that people don't want that. The problem is the institutional resistance to the will of the people actually being served in the United States. <laughs> and that, to me, is the conversation that all these like-minded people need to be having right now. Who is it that we need to be, and what is it that we need to do to break through that wall of resistance? Uh, I want to begin by uh, talking about some experiences that I had this week, like telling you about my summer vacation, but it was actually telling you about my week, and particularly two things that happened to me this week. One is that on Tuesday, I spent the day in East Palestine, Ohio. And I had read, I understood the statistics, I understood the basic outline of what occurred there. I knew what Norfolk Southern had done and not done. I knew about their antiquated braking system. I knew about the chemicals that were in those trains. I knew about the burn that they did. I knew that the EPA had said you can burn one and then they burned five. I knew that those chemicals shouldn't even be there. I knew that that is a sacrifice zone. I knew that this is not an uncommon occurrence treating neighborhoods and areas like this in such an irresponsible way. But I wanted to go to East Palestine, Ohio because I wanted to have the human experience talking to people there, uh, talking to the actual human beings who have experienced and are continuing to experience the horror, the calamity that befell these people's lives. And I heard story after story. I asked people if they would come up and tell their story. And of course, you've got to remember that you're talking about an area of the country. And actually, my point is that that is most areas of this country where the people do not live lives where they can absorb a calamity because they're already living on the edge. And so what happened here was not only what Norfolk Southern did, it's so much worse than the train derailment. It's what the EPA did not do. It's what the state government still isn't doing. It's what the federal government still isn't doing. It's about the profound neglect of people who have been tested. They know they have benzene poisoning. They know they have vinyl chloride poisoning. And there is nothing that they can do. Now, I, I wonder what most people in this room would do if, God forbid, something happened to your, uh, to your house tonight. Let's say you go back to your apartment and there was a fire. Would you know where to go? Where would you go? What would you do? And my real question is, what would you do if everybody that you know, including your family, was in the same situation? Where are you supposed to go? And you are told that all of this is contaminated. It's not just your body that's been contaminated. Don't touch that table. Don't touch, touch that bed. So even if you could sell your house, which you probably cannot do, because who's going to buy that house now? Don't take those furniture, those pieces of furniture with you because they are all contaminated. And what about the kids who go to school? The situation is so much worse just hearing human beings talk about it than anything you can even imagine. And there's basically no hope because they write to the EPA, or they write to Sherrod Brown, or they write to J.D. Vance, or they write to Governor DeWine, or they write to uh, Joe Biden, who, what geniuses in this town told him he shouldn't even bother to go there? Trump went there, showed up with uncontaminated water. I wonder how much money that operative, that genius, was paid to say you don't have to go to Ohio. But this is what was really interesting to me that I left with and I can't stop thinking about. I was so impressed by these people, smart people, uh, you know, people who they know exactly what happened. And I was very impressed by these people. And they were nice people. And they were good people. 
And there was this one woman, I'm not gonna say her name, let's say her name was Carly. And Carly was, man, she was, man, she was in the face of Norfolk Southern. She was in the face of the EPA. And what they do is these people have to go live in hotels, but Norfolk Southern won't give them the money. They have to put the money down for the hotel and then Norfolk Southern might reimburse them. But you don't really know who's gonna get reimbursed and who's not gonna get reimbursed. And people who are two miles away from the train derailment, they have rashes and bloody no noses and all of these horrible symptoms. But Norfolk Southern is saying, oh no, just one mile. There's a, there's a line past which we're not responsible. So this one woman named Carly, so-called Carly tonight. She was man in their face and she really knows what Norfolk Southern is doing and she knows what the EPA hasn't done. And these people know that when they, even when they came in because they were begging them, they were begging them. I remember after Fukushima reading about a man who was begging when the Japanese officials came to his town. He was begging, here's my urine, please test my urine. And the official just closed the elevator door in his face. These people are begging, please, please test my well, please test my air. And then even when somebody comes to test the air, it was a testing done by a company hired by Norfolk Southern. But this is what really got me. So Carly is in their face and she's describing how she goes up to Norfolk Southern and it was interesting because the people who made the most noise, who would not back down, who demanded help, they were the ones who tended to get it because nobody wanted to have to deal with people like that. And I made some comment about Carly. I said, that's what we need. She said, I'm a relentless and a persistent woman. And I was saying, that's what we need in this country, more uh, uh, re <laughs> persistent and relentless women. And everybody was going, yeah. And I said, and I was explaining and I was talking about how East Palestine is just the embodiment. It's a microcosm of what is happening in this country. These huge, soulless corporate entities who just screw people time and time and time again and don't care and add insult to the injury and then more injury to the insult. One man yelled out, man, you run for president on that and you'll win on that. So then later, we're talking more about that and these people understand what has happened to them and they understand what this represents in terms of corporate dynamics and governmental dynamics when you have something like the EPA who is apparently just aiding in the cover-up. And then at the end, I said, if I'm president, what would you have me do? Now at this point, we've discussed it all. We've talked about deregulations, we've talked about train breaks, we've talked about warning systems, we have talked about the fact that the workers were not listened to. We've talked about all of it, just the way anybody in this room would talk about it. And I said, so what would you have me do? If I were to become president, what would you have me do? And Carla raised her hand and three guesses what she said. Come on, somebody, what do you think Carly said at that point? Yes? What did he say? I said Right, Norfolk Southern, something having to do with Norfolk Southern. Does anybody else have any ideas? Yes, sir. Nationalize Norfolk Southern. Nationalize Norfolk Southern. Anybody else have any ideas? Anybody? Protect the Second Amendment. Fascinating, huh? Now, Something else happened to me, and that was the day before I went to, North, uh, went to East Palestine, and that was a podcast I was on with a man whose name I'm not going to mention. He's a nice guy. He's always been nice to me. He's, uh, I can probably count on one hand the pundits in that particular area who have been fair and kind to me, and he has been. But I was on his podcast, and he was asking me the kinds of questions that many of those people ask me. He said, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Joe Biden's done pretty good. He said, Joe Biden's done, he said, Joe Biden, you know, the economy is, is good by all indicators. I said, oh, it is? Who's it good for? I talked to him about the fact that 20% of Americans are living on an economic island of economic well-being, but that that island is surrounded by 80% of Americans who are living in a sea of economic despair. And I started talking to him about the fact that one in four Americans live with medical debt, that 18 million Americans cannot afford to fill the prescriptions that their doctors give to them, that people are rationing their insulin in this country, the fact that 85 million people are uninsured or underinsured, to which he responded, well, we have universal health care in this country, don't we? And I realized in that moment, and I realized after I went to East Palestine, the divide in this country is dramatic, but the divide in this country is not between left and right. The divide in this country is between those who chronically suffer 
and those who don't have a clue. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to move to Washington, D.C. after I ran for president last time was because you know, I wanted to get the, the feel of the energy here, to really be in this, in this area where you know, I had already been in the belly of the beast. I wanted to know what the energy was here, and it was interesting to me because I already had all so often heard that Washington, D.C. Is a, is, a, is, a, is a bubble. That's what they call it. It's a bubble, but it's more than a bubble. It's a walled city. Now, there are really wonderful people here, and I meet a lot of wonderful people here at Bus Boys and Poets. There are wonderful people everywhere. I mean, I've learned that enough in my life. It's not about good people versus bad people. No socioeconomic group has a monopoly on values. No socioeconomic group has a monopoly on not caring or anything like that. It's about systems. But there is an America out there that is unseen by the policymakers in this country. And let me tell you what's going to happen as I see it, because I think my saying how I see it is relevant to whatever consideration somebody might give, him, might give me. It cannot continue like this. It is unsustainable. It cannot continue like this. Things are going to get very, very, very much better or they are going to get very, very, very much worse. How many of you watched that Mussolini show on CNN last night? <laughs> you think uh, regular transaction status quo politics are going to beat that back, do you? No, absolutely. Really? No. You think status quo politics is going to beat that back? No. no, it's not. And our problem is not going to be people who just believe in Donald Trump. And when Donald Trump said, you know, I could cheat somebody on Fifth Avenue and I would get away with it because some of my supporters wouldn't care. I think he's actually right. Yeah. So why do we keep trying to convince those people otherwise? You could put this man in jail, they won't care. The danger to the Democrats in 2024 is not people voting for Donald Trump. The danger to Democrats in 2024 is droves of people staying home. And many of those people, many of those people who will stay home, in my experience and from what I hear and what I'm told by them, are young people who in their experience haven't actually seen that much difference between the parties. There hasn't been that much visceral difference when it comes to their health care. There hasn't been any visceral difference when it comes to their ability to get educated. There hasn't been any visceral difference when it comes to their getting out of the shackles, these invisible chains of these college loan debts. And the idea that that generation, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, and I'm going to do it right here right now, how many people in this room have either heard a young person say or are a young person who has said, under normal circumstances, I would think about having children. But given the state of the planet, I don't think it would be a responsible thing to do. Please keep your hands up. Please keep your hands up. And I want everybody in this room to now look around. This is not normal. This is not normal. So you think a younger generation, given the fact that what just happened right here, that many hands in this room going up, saying under normal circumstances, I would consider having children, but I'm not going to do that because of the state of the planet. The fact that that is my experience in every room I go into and ask that question in every state that I have asked it, and there have been many, you think that generation is going to show up and go to political war for a man who approved the Willow Project? No. No. Really? A man who has given more uh, permits for oil drilling? than even Donald Trump did. A man who won't even reopen the East Jerusalem consulate for the Palestinians. A man who will not even mention what is happening there this week. A man who will not even mention that what is happening on the southern border right now. Oh, you think we have an issue right now? You think we have an issue with all those desperate people trying to get in here? Oh, it's such an immigration crisis. Oh, America has such a crisis. Poor America, we have such a crisis. The crisis is not our crisis. Our crisis is the humanitarian crisis of all those thousands of people, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people.
who are escaping the most desperate situations, who are moving through the most harrowing journey to get here in hopes that maybe they could get a job as a busboy and, and raise their children in peace. And the United States of America, let me tell you, needs a leader who will say, America, I love you, but this is what we're gonna do now. You're gonna look in the mirror. That's what we're gonna do. <laughs> we're gonna look in the mirror. And we, we are not going to ignore the role that US foreign policy has played in Latin America for decades now that has contributed. <laughs> And many of those sanctions in Latin America that we just assumed would be the things that Biden would reverse. We talk so much about how he's gone so far left. What we should also be talking about is how many Trump era policies have remained in place. <laughs> Not all of them, but a lot of them. <laughs> and so we have a very, we have to have a very, very serious conversation among ourselves. And remember when I say among ourselves, let's remember how many millions of Americans do not disagree with the things that we were talking about here tonight. But if we continue to go along, we continue to go along. It's interesting as a woman to be erased. It's interesting as a woman to be invisibilized. My friend Steven Donziger was talking about how he has talked to all these environmental activists and he, they have talked about, you know, he said, well, the Willow Project, and he is permitting all of this, all of this uh, exportation of liquefied natural gas and more, more oil permits than even, even Donald Trump had allowed. And Stephen told me how many environmental activists have said, well, what else have we got? Hello! <laughs> what else have we got? You know, what else are we not willing to look at? You know, I remember during the 1990s when Barbara Ehrenreich wrote an article that was in the New York Times, and it was something that hit me like a brick to the forehead. She said, what has happened to the left in this country? She said, I'll tell you what happened to the left in this country that has been so devastating to the left in this country. And then she said it, and it blew my mind and struck me, and it has just stayed within me. She said, what devastated the left in this country is we were all invited to the White House once. <laughs> what whores we have become. You, ooh, I got a White House Christmas card. I remember somebody telling me when Obama became president, a man I know who runs a huge poverty organization, I said, what's the difference between the Obama presidency, the Obama administration, and the Bush administration? You know what his answer was? The Obama administration returns our calls. Boy, have we been played. Boy, have we been played. Well, they'll still take my call. They'll schmooze me. They'll tell me they really care. A man who was in East Palestine, who was one of the activists there this week, told me that he had attended a meeting in the White House and had been told by a Biden official, well, we didn't know people are actually sick. We didn't know people are actually sick. So I believe that we need to make a complete U-turn in this country. And I appreciate the incremental changes that this president has done that in some ways have been, have been positive. But we are a big ship and we are headed for the iceberg. And status quo incremental politics just means we will hit the iceberg at a different angle. We need to do more than hit the iceberg at a different angle. We need to turn this ship around. Yeah. We need to turn the ship around. We need an economic U-turn in this country. And the economic U-turn that we need in this country means issues and policies that are considered moderate positions in every other advanced democracy. Every other advanced democracy plus other advanced countries have universal health care. Every other advanced democracy has free college tuition and tech school. Every other advanced democracy has free child care. Every other advanced democracy has paid maternity and paternity leave. Every other advanced democracy has guaranteed sick pay. Every other advanced democracy has guaranteed livable wage. And we sit there while these people say to us, well, well you know, it's complicated. How long before we just yell from the bottom of our guts? It's not complicated. It is just so corrupt. One thing 
thing that I have realized, you know, I've been out there for a long time. I've been a Democrat all my life. And I remember I would say to people, oh, you know, we really got, you know, I'm really dealing with a lot of these sick people. I'm really dealing with a lot of people, you know, they have to work more than one job. I'm really dealing with a lot of people who are going through very desperate situations. Their kids can't go to college. There's a lot of racial stuff and lack of uh, justice in this town, criminal justice. These people who are incarcerated, we've got to do something. And my friends who were in high places would go, yeah, you know, we really should, we really should. And then I would ask them again five years later, we really need to do something about this. You know, this is really becoming terrible. You know, people can't live like this. We have the majority of Americans living in economic, chronic economic anxiety. We have a third of Americans who are living in economic instability. We have a third of American workers living on less than $15 an hour. They can't find a place to live. We have 25, we have half of our seniors living on less than $25,000 a year. And I would say to these same friends in high places, you really gotta do something. And they say, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 we're gonna do a little bit here, we're gonna do a little bit there, we're really gonna do that. And then after about 10 years, I realized, oh, you sweet motherfuckers, you're not gonna do it anymore. <laughs> the status quo will not disrupt itself. That is what we have to realize now. The status quo will not disrupt itself. If the status quo is going to be disrupted, it's going to be because we, the people, yeah. disrupt it. And that's, that's simply the truth. And that has always been thus. You know, abolition didn't emerge from a political party. Abolition emerged from the people. Yeah. And the political party found out they had to go along. And women's suffrage didn't emerge from a political party. It emerged from the women's party. And political parties realized they're going to have to go along. And the labor movement didn't, didn't, the response of the Gilded Age at that time didn't emerge from the political parties. It emerged from the labor movement and the political parties realized they were going to have to go along. And the civil rights movement, desegregation of the American South, didn't come from the political parties. It emerged from the people, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and people realized they were going to have to go along. Today, it is not a particular circumstance. You know, that's the thing. It's not a specific tumor. And if you only get rid of the tumor, then you're, the problem is over with. That's what we had hoped, of course, with beating uh, Donald Trump in 2020 was the hope that the problem was over. No, the problem was not over. The cancer of hate had already metastasized. And so now we have an even bigger problem. But it's not one, one tumor that invasive measures can get rid of. It's lack of health care over here. It's chronic economic anxiety over there. It's the mental health crisis over here. But darn, can we talk about the source of that mental health crisis and how much of it has to do with poverty and the economic chronic anxiety that people are living with? No, 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 no. Let's try to make it about something else so that another pharmaceutical option can make another multi-billion dollar fortune profit center off that area of human suffering. And so what's happening now, it's just more like an atomizer spray of injustice. Mm -hmm. And in order to deal with this, it's going to have to be more than a political revolution. It's going to have to be a revolution of consciousness. It's going to have to be people standing up and saying, this cannot continue on our watch. And no, we cannot wait until 2028. No. We cannot wait until 2028. Yeah. Now, I don't have any kind of Donald Trump, oh, I'm the only one who can fix it. I don't believe that at all. But I do notice. When it comes to these things, I'm kind of the only one who's here. Yeah. Yeah. And you might ask yourself, where are they? Where are they all? Why aren't they coming over the hill? Have you ever asked yourself that? Because it's a machine. Because it's a game. It's a game while people are suffering. And human suffering is not a game. And this situation will not fundamentally improve. There will not be a fundamental pattern disruption unless enough people stand up. And as we stand up, we're going to need more than data. The era of data collection is over. That's why, you know, I love this bit about reparations, right? So the White House has said that they support H.R. 40. H.R. 40, it's funny, it was that, that, that particular bill was, uh, was articulated by an old friend of mine, the late John Conyers. John Conyers is the first person who would be rolling his eyes. He would say, that was then, this is now. We really don't need to collect any more evidence. We kind of know what happened. We don't need another study about the effects of slavery. 
on generation after generation after generation of American black people. We don't need another study, and we don't need a president who says, yes, but I think Congress should handle that. Wink, wink. Another study, wink. And Congress handle it, wink. No, we need a president who says to black leaders, we're going to go to Camp David let, next weekend. Let's put some money on the table and get this conversation started. I wonder if Franklin Roosevelt would be allowed into the Democratic Party today or if he would be considered too left wing. Now, Don, uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt said that he had come to realize, in large part because of the influence of his wife, as we know, he had come to realize that the amelioration of stress was not enough. He said we need fundamental economic reform. He also said that a company that did not pay its workers a livable wage should not even exist. Franklin Roosevelt, looking at one-third of Americans unemployed at that time. We do not have one-third of Americans unemployed at this time, but we do have one-third of Americans living with a level of economic despair. He said he had come to realize that we need to become fairly radical for a generation. Now remember, what fairly radical is in America at this point is moderate positions in every other advanced democracy. I'm reminded of Winston Churchill saying that you can always count on Americans to do the right thing uh, as long as <laughs> after we have exhausted every other option. <laughs> and that's pretty much history. You can count on Americans to do the right thing after we have uh, exhausted every other option. And what I would say to you is I think we've exhausted every other option. Yeah. We are now faced with a challenge. You know, some people say, Marianne, how could you be running? Don't you understand the fascists are at the door? Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, I'm running because I understand that the facts are at the door. And I understand the story of David and Goliath, and I'll leave you with this. The story of David and Goliath is not just a story about small versus big. That's not, that's just the least of it. The story is about the fact that with all the warriors of Israel who knew, the, war, the Israelites knew that this, this, this Goliath was so big and the giants were laughing at all those great warriors. And David wasn't even a warrior. He wasn't even one of them. You know, he was a fringe, not serious kind of guy. And he goes in there and he says, I'll do it. They said, you'll do it? He says, yes, I'll do it. And Saul, King Saul, said to David, the least I can do, given that you're doing this for us, I will give you my coat of armor. And David put it on and he said, no, I've got to take this off. If I'm going to do it, I have to do it my way. And the way David did it was that David took his slingshot and he hit the giant in the one place where the giant is vulnerable between his eyes. The giant had no soul. He hit him in that proverbial third eye, which is on the dollar bill, the great seal of the United States. That's how he defeated the giant. Not that he was big. Not that he had the technological power, not that he had the financial power, not that he had the warrior power. But what he had was soulfulness. And that giant has no soulfulness. Whether it is the ideological threat of fascism, which is attacking us from the outside and attacking our democracy, or neoliberalism itself, which is eroding our democracy from the inside. Neither one of them. They have no soul. They have no soul. They have no ethics, they have no concern, they have no compassion. It's a machine. It's not that the individuals don't. This is not about not nice people. This is about the way our country operates right now. It's about a soulless economic system which has our government in its grip. It's about a government that at this point does more than not simply chops wood and carries water for this huge corporate aristocracy. Whether it's insurance companies or pharmaceutical companies or big agricultural companies, big food companies, big chemical companies, big uh, gun manufacturers, oil companies. And let me tell you something more about oil companies. Oh, you think we have a problem at the border now, do you? Just wait till we have 100 or 200 million climate refugees with nowhere else to go because we did not stop fossil fuel extraction and entire swaths of continents are unlivable. 
And you add all of those corporate entities that I just mentioned, you add to that the military industrial complex, our defense contractors. And we have a corporate aristocracy which is no different than the aristocracy that we repudiated in 1776. Well, our ancestors repudiated in 1776 and it's our turn to repudiate them again. <laughs> Winston Churchill might be right. We got there late, but we got there. We have ancestors who responded to slavery with abolition. We have ancestors who responded to the institutionalized suppression of women with the women's suffrage movement. We have ancestors who responded to the first Gilded Age with the labor movement. We have ancestors who responded to segregation with the civil rights movement. My message to you, why I'm running for president and why I hope that you will consider helping me is that I believe with all my heart, it's our turn now and we can do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whatever you think. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very sweet of you. Thank you. Yeah, I said her name was Carly. Her oh, name was Neera. Carly. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Carly, I think her response to you about they don't have money, they're getting poisoned, their faces are red, is Second Amendment. Um, it's indicative of how successful the Republicans are in messaging. And one of the things they've been very uh, successful with is the vilification of immigrants. And Andy himself, The narrative about immigrants over such a short period of time to the demonization of, of immigrants has truly been a, a horrifying thing to see and the absolute lies. Uh, for instance, if you look at statistics, uh, more crime is committed by uh, people who are uh, who are natural born American citizens. Also, there's a lot of talk about drug smuggling. The vast majority of the drug smuggling, including fentanyl, is brought through by natural born Americans who are entering legally. So there's just lie after lie after lie. And uh, once again, as you said, and I hope that I, I did my best to try to help correct that tonight, Americans not realizing the level of violence, the level of despair and horror that so many of these people are trying to escape, uh, people not uh, taking the time perhaps to really think about what, how horrible your life has to be where you are, uh, to be willing to trek through uh, those terrible, terrible conditions in those deserts and so forth, the way they are in the hopes of having a life here that is simply survivable. Um, and also, as I mentioned, how much U.S. foreign policy, particularly sanctions and other destabilizing factors, have contributed uh, to the dire poverty that so many people are now trying to escape. And we, each in our own way, can do what we can to change that narrative. Yes, sir.
I just heard him, I heard what you said until you said uh, Citizens United. And then what did you say after that? Well, that was before even Citizens United, of course, and those are, are, are uh, Supreme Court decisions. We all know that uh, the fact that uh, Donald Trump was given uh, three opportunities uh, to appoint Supreme Court justices is, uh, wow. Well. And uh, so I think it's not reasonable, given the uh, current uh, makeup of the Supreme Court, it is not reasonable to assume that we are going to be able to override, uh, overturn Citizens United anytime soon. I do think that we, as a generation of Americans, as adults, need to become as focused on that goal of overturning Citizens United as obviously other citizens were focused on the goal of overturning Citi uh, Roe v. Wade over the last few decades. We have to become uh, that concentrated. Uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse has done a lot of work really talking about uh, and really uh, revealing the, the plans that were, that were effectuated in order to get the kind of corporate hacks that we have on the Supreme Court today. But in the meantime, and as we know, it's not only uh, Citizens United, it's also gerrymandering and so forth. I think when I go out into the country, I think people really understand that ground zero, not just on the issue of, um, of, of women's rights, also on the issue of transgender and so many other issues, gutting child labor laws, which you see now in Arkansas and Iowa, which I find particularly horrifying. When it comes to women's rights, it's so much worse than abortion rights. Uh, you've got uh, that six-week ban in, in Florida when many women don't even know they're pregnant yet. Do you know that there are 21 legislators in South Carolina who've actually signed on to a bill that would have a woman who had had an abortion executed? But I have to tell you something. If you haven't read about what's going on in South Carolina, the women in the state house there are amazing. And it's not just Democratic women. It's also Republican women and independent women who are pushing back. There's a real story of uh, women, some brave, brave things that are going on pushing back in South Carolina. <laughs> And what I talk about quite a lot when I'm out there is that we need, as I said before, we need an uprising inside ourselves. Yeah. You know, I think particularly, particularly I think those of us more on the left have thought, well, you know, I vote in the midterms, I vote in the presidential, you know, I, 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 I do my civic duty. At this point, we have to become a generation who sees citizenship and civic activism as simply a layer of a well-lived, meaningful life in a way that has never been true before. And, and when I say this out in the country, that you need to, you know, you need to make a hot date, I'm going to a city council meeting on Tuesday. <laughs> you want to come with me? You know, that that has to be what we see as what we do with our lives, that you know what's going on in your cities and you know what's going on in your communities, you know what's going on in your state houses. And when I say to progressives out in the country, I feel that I'm heard when I say, it should never have gotten this bad. Yeah. Yeah. We should never have let it get this bad. But it's, it's the 11th hour, but it's not midnight yet. In terms of what you're saying, the bottom line answer to what you're saying, though, sir, is there's only one thing that can override this, and that's cit uh, citizens at the ballot box. Not that this is got, uh, that electoral politics is the only thing. You know, you see things like the revitalization of the labor movement. It's got to be an inside-outside. But we have to begin seeing marching to the ballot box the way other generations are marching in the streets. <clears throat> Especially since the people who run this town don't care how many people are marching in the streets. I mean, when you think about the fact that Black Lives Matter movement is the single largest protest movement in the history of the United States and not one single serious legislative action has resulted. But let, by all means, let's continue with those guys because they're doing a bang up job. Yeah, who, uh, who else, somebody else, yes ma'am.
exclusion legislators will be wondering if HUD is a bipartisan plan to reconcile this Well, first of all, and if anybody goes to Marianne 2024 and looks at my issues page, I assure you I have more plans, and did in 2020 for that matter, uh, than any other candidate, I assure you. So I have plenty of plans. <laughs> and I, this, you know, Joe Biden is a nice man. This is not personal for me at all, and he did, let's not, pretend he didn't have. I mean, if Build Back Better had, had uh, been passed, that would have been truly amazing. Uh, and, you know, it's not like Manson and Cinema were not there. However, I will tell you this. Uh, when I think of the political system that needs to be challenged, I'm thinking of a political system that is the same whether you're talking about elite Republicans or elite Democrats. That's my concern. And as I said before, our, our democracy is under attack from the outside by this neo-fascist, neo-authoritarian threat, which is not nothing, but neoliberal, hyper-capitalistic, crony capitalistic, trickle-down economics has eroded it from the inside. So you've got neo-fascism as the disease, but you've got this weakened immune system which neoliberalism has, has, uh, has produced. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt said, we would not have to worry, he said, about a communist or a fascist takeover as long as democracy delivered on its promises. That is the problem here. Democracy has not delivered on its promises. If democracy was delivering on its promises, one third of Americans would not be living in huge economic despair. We would not have the highest poverty rate of any advanced democracy, the highest child poverty rate, a million American children who go to school, but they live in a car with their parents, they are homeless. If democracy delivered on its promises, we would not have these huge issues that has to do with the quality of our food, the quality of our air, the quality of our water, the guns on our street, this gargantuan uh, military budget, which is doing very, very little to keep us secure. We have really got to take on this topic, national security. What does that even mean when people don't have homes that are secure? They don't have a living that is secure. They don't have health that is secure. They don't have water that is secure. They don't have, what is national security, right? So at this point, we are, we are living at a, at a time where this has to be challenged. This kind of corporatist mentality has to be challenged wherever it is. Today's, re, demo, the, the establishment corporatist Democrats today are who the Republicans were when I was growing up. And when I was growing up, liberals, what we think of today as progressives, were not treated like unruly children. We're treated like unruly children by those who would say that we're trying to hijack the Democratic Party. Well, I'm sorry, I've read American history. They hijacked the Democratic Party. We didn't want it back. <laughs> We're Eleanor and Roosevelt, they're the DuPonts and the Morgans. Once again, nice people. It's not about not nice people. And that's really important. Not every rich person is a greedy bastard. Not every person in power is completely emotionally distant from the ravages of human suffering, although enough of them are that it's a serious problem. And at this point, this should not be enabled anymore. This should not be coddled anymore. At a certain point, who among us hasn't had a lover who comes back every single time? And they come back. It's like a lover who comes back every two years, every four years. Come on, baby, give me another chance. No! 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 The hour is too late. And I have to tell you something about that crowd that runs things. I swear to God, I don't know what they're so proud of. They're so self-congratulatory. They have dinners to congratulate themselves. They're so what are they so proud of? They, we are six inches from the cliff. We are six inches from the cliff in terms of the state of our democracy. We are six inches from the cliff in terms of the state of our economy. We are six inches from the cliff in terms of the state of everything that is most precious to us. Now they would argue, and I'm gonna bring in myself a little bit on this because I am running. These people would argue that only someone 
who has had a career for decades entrenched in the car that drove us into this ditch should possibly be considered qualified to lead us out of this ditch. I, re I, I disagree with that entirely. This town is filled with very good political car mechanics. The problem is not that we don't have good political car mechanics in Washington. The problem is that we are on the wrong road. So I'll tell you something, and these will be my final words to you, and I'll let you have your night, and I'm so grateful that you came here. You're right. I, I really, my qualification is not that I know how to effectuate and maintain that dysfunctional, malevolent system, but I do believe I stand before you with the qualifications to help disrupt it. Thank you. Very, very, very. Yes, Julian Assange, Julian Assange, Julian Assange should not be in Belmarsh Prison. He should be home with Stella and those two beautiful little boys. Uh, Julian Assange, it, it's just stunning to me the way a journalist in this country uh, don't seem to realize that if they can do that to Julian Assange, they can do that to any of you. We have a national security press, which at this point has become, in too many cases, not entirely, but in too many cases, little more than stenographers for whatever the Defense Department's uh, spokesman tells them. That Defense Department, where our Secretary of Defense is a former Raytheon board member. And so they just, they call journalism just taking down whatever those secretaries tell them. They know they did that in, in, uh, it, with Iraq, and yet how different is it even now? That's what was so horrifying about last night. It was like a throwback. Didn't we already see this terrible movie? So Julian Assange, Julian Assange being tried. Julian Assange, this is wrong that Julian Assange is in prison. It is wrong that he's being tried. This is one of the areas, even Barack Obama had said, well, we better drop this because if we go after him, we're going to have to go after the New York Times. This is one of the areas where we, many of us just assumed that once Biden got in office, he would reverse a Trump position. He not only has reversed, it, not reversed that Trump position, he's apparently doubling down on it. Free Julian Assange. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Is this a symbol of liberty and justice? Thank you.